Hey, welcome back. Eric Arnold bringing you an episode of the Politics Barn on this Monday, March 7th. We're outdoors today. This is what we call it the Politics Trail. It's a little windy. The sound is probably going to suck, but we'll do the best we can. I killed two birds with one stone. Uh, doing some exercise and talking to you people at the same time. Topic today, of course, the war, the Russian-Ukrainian war. I'm getting a better feel of what's the right thing to do, at least according to my political way of thinking, gathering more information. What are we in, day 12 of this thing now? My initial instinct when this all got rolling was we ought to stay out of this and on day 12 I'm now pretty much sure we should stay out of this which is of course the exact opposite of which way the elites the powers that be the people in command in this country are pushing us and so that's where I'm pretty sure they're wrong I'm right as a usual. I just look around me and every day that goes by, there's just another escalation of this thing. You know, somebody else is sending uh, more bullets, more aid. They're talking about sending fighter jets, although nobody will seem to claim credit for that one. Uh, The United States Secretary of State said on Sunday that that's a go, or I think he said it's a green light, that any NATO power can send fighter jets if they want. And then, of course, all the NATO powers are like, well, not I, said the wolf. We're not sending fighter jets. So, you know, I don't know if that's a work, if that's a, if that's a trick. Ooh, we have a trap here. What's going on here? Got a tree down across the trail. Oh, I guess I'll be. I was unable to remove the obstacle. I, uh, yeah, that's what you do when you're old. You overestimate how fast, how strong you are. You think you can do things you used to be able to do 20 years ago, and then when it comes time to do it, your body goes, what are you doing? What are you talking about? We're not going to lift that giant log. So, where were we? Back to the war. Yeah, I, you know, it's almost like nobody has ever lived through the Cold War. That nobody has ever taken nuclear war seriously. It's like we're just, you know, laughing in this guy's face, Putin, daring him to escalate this thing. And the thing has escalated in little ways here and there. It's escalating seemingly every day. And if it keeps, the longer it goes, the more chances are it's really going to escalate. I just look around and you know, I'll give you some examples of the elites trying to push you into a war. They're grooming you, you know, in no less of a, an aggressive fashion than a pedophile would be grooming his victim. They had a poll out the other day done by Reuters, an elitist leftist news organization and I say news with my tongue firmly in my cheek because what comes out of Reuters could be more considered propaganda and less considered news. Well they had a poll saying that and it was something crazy. It was I think 75% of Americans would support a no-fly zone over to Ukraine. Yeah, right there, I know that's a lie. Uh, You can't get 75% of Americans to agree on whether they like ice cream or not. 
there's no way three quarters of Americans would support a no-fly zone over the Ukraine. That's simply a lie. In the business, that's what we call a push pull. Push pull. In other words, I put out a fraudulent poll detailing the results that I want detailed. In other words, if I want you to think chocolate is the most popular flavor of ice cream, then I put out a poll saying three quarters of Americans like chocolate. And you might go, oh, I didn't realize it was that high. And my husband's uh, allergic to chocolate, but gee, three quarters of Americans like chocolate. Well, there's no way three quarters of Americans want a no-fly zone. For one thing, anyone that has half an idea of what that means knows that's war. <laughs> if we're going to start shooting down every Russian helicopter and uh, jet over Ukrainian airspace, they're going to shoot back. They're not just going to let us shoot them down. That's war. <laughs> That's a shooting war with a nuclear power. Do we really want that? Yet that's what a lot of the, uh, you know, it's incrementally going that way. There's a lot of people now. You know, you see these retired generals on every last cable news show. Well, I don't think we should take anything off the table. I think we need to do X and we need to do Y. And, and X and Y are always an escalatory thing. I saw our esteemed former president, Bush Jr., talking that, hey, might need to do more. You know, nothing off the table. Uh, I saw Marco Rubio, senator from Florida, would be president. He was running around Twitter warning us that there might be a false flag operation here shortly. What does that mean, false flag? That means a lie, that there's going to be a lie on behalf of the Russians. Uh, for example, the Ukrainians, you know, this is what the lie would be under Rubio's theory. Uh, the Ukrainians will be committing an act of uh, war crime of some type, that they will wholesale slaughter surrendered Russian prisoners, or the Ukrainians will detonate a dirty bomb, something to that effect. And Rubio is telling you that if that happens, that didn't happen. In other words, the Russians did it and want you to think that the Ukrainians did it as the Russians are trying to weaken your resolve to aid the Ukraine. Now, of course, Rubio doesn't leave any room at all that the opposite could be true, too, that the Ukrainians and or aided by the United States or whatnot may do the exact same thing. And if you think that's ridiculous, I refer you in history to something like the Gulf of Tonkin, which we used as a pretext to basically declare war on North Vietnam, which I think in history is still incredibly dubious whether there was any provocation there at all, but we drummed it up into an attack on the United States that required basically us to go to war. You can go back all the way into uh, the turn of the 20th century. 1898, was it? Remember the Maine. You ever heard of that? Probably not. Well, I was the war cry back then because we had the Maine. It was a battleship. It was parked at a Spanish port, I believe, in Cuba. I think the Spanish controlled Cuba back then. And it blew up. Well, we blamed them. They said, said they sabotaged it, put a bomb in it. The whole thing exploded. Uh, best guess is now, under the sober light of reflection, the main blew up on its own. <laughs> it was just 
not a sabotage event. Probably just blew up on its own. But we blamed Spain and used it as a uh, pretext for starting a war with Spain. So false flags have a, a historical link going all the way back, I'm sure. It's usually not admitted to by elitists, by people in power. You know, that's one of their tricks. It's like a magnitude. Uh, ma Magi magician, magician, I can't talk today. Mag Magician's trick. They don't like to reveal their tricks. Well, that's a governmental trick to influencing public opinion. Uh, false flag. Depending on who you talk to, you may say that COVID was a false flag. I'm not prepared to go that far, but I know some people would make that argument. So it's a, a fake emergency. It's a fake event. It's made, you, made to make you think one thing when reality is the other thing. And I find it telling that Rubio, who wants to escalate the war, is running around warning us that the Russians are going to stage some kind of false flag. I'm going to gather my thoughts here. When this all started, I sort of thought that Biden would put some fake, phony, baloney sanctions in place and nothing that would really hurt the Russians or really escalate this. And I think initially that's sort of what he did. Now, I'm not sure where Biden is as far as, is he driving? I mean, he's probably involved. Let's, not, let's be frank here. What they're trying to do is they're trying to build popular opinion to continue the escalation. You know, they're already grooming us that $4.50 gasoline is normal. Well, of course it's not normal, and it hurts like hell. And we shouldn't have to pay it. This idea that I need to do my patriotic duty and pay an extra $5,000 a year in gasoline costs for the glory of a greater Ukraine is bullshit. But that's what they're grooming us for. And it's not going to stop at four fifty. I mean, $5? Maybe 6 All the while, they refuse to pump gas in this country. It's crazy. It, it, it's just absolutely crazy. These people are so blinded by their hatred of the oil and gas industry and their blind faith in renewable energies, which, hey, sure, who doesn't love windmills and hydroelectric? And, well, that's basically what they got there. I guess solar, throw that in there too. None of that works nearly efficiently enough to power a giant economy like ours. You know, if they'd just be honest and say, look, we don't think oil and gas is the way of the future. We think this country needs to wean itself off of that. I'd probably be half sympathetic because they're at least being honest. But they don't do that. They just, you know, it's okay if we burn another country's oil and gas and pay through the nose for it and give up political advantage because we have to pay for it. You know, maybe this is an argument that we should have at another time, not when we're teetering on the edge of recession and war. But, you know, that's the Democrats. They want to force you into buying that electric car. They won't admit that, but that's exactly what they're doing. So, that's bad. Now, I'm going to shut it off here. One point that the neocons, what is a neocon? Somebody that wants war, always war, more war. The United States needs to be everybody's alpha male, needs to be everybody's policeman. The one argument the neocons make repeatedly is that Putin is nobody's friend. That you know, 
if you're on the side of Putin, you're on the wrong side, of course. So, you know, once again, I freely admit to be being a Putin appeaser, if that's what you want to call me. But the other point nobody's mentioning is Zelensky, president of the Ukraine, who I saw was just awarded by some elite, some authoritarian, the Ronald Reagan Award of Freedom. He's nobody's friend either. Bear with me. But don't want the picture taken, so I'm trying to be respectful. At any rate, Zelensky, with his re- continuing exhortations, his continuing propaganda, directly selling our representatives in Congress, which I find a little bit funny in that I can't just call up my senator, call up my representative and talk to him. This guy's got more access to my representative than I do. And he's basically begging them, shaming them, whatever he thinks he can do to get us into this thing. If we get into this, it is war. World War III, that's no less of what it is. The only question is how will it be fought? And he's the one that's trying to instigate it, you know. He's the one with his tit in the ringer, not us. We have no obligation to help this guy out. Frankly, I don't know he's worth helping out. You know, we only hear what a sainted hero he is. You're only getting half the story. I'm sure of that. So, I, uh, I don't like it every time I hear Zelensky saying, we need to be involved, NATO, they're cowards, whatever. Yeah, all right, whatever, buddy. What exactly do we get out of this? For that matter, what does he get out of this? I mean, I see kind of, I don't know, three main outcomes to this. You know, one, let's say this ends today, that the Russians make a deal with Zelensky and it's over. Well, he loses some power. Maybe he loses all his power. And the Russians gain some portion of the country. And now they have to live under Putin's authoritarianism rather than the uh, wonderful democracy that Zelensky had set up or some something in between. And then what else dies for the most part? So that'd be one. You know, two, this drags on and on and on. And then the Russians ultimately win, maybe in a fashion that's on uh, with the same terms that perhaps are on the table today, maybe with terms even more favorable to the Russians. So a lot more people die, and Zelensky and his country loses again. And then the third one, I guess, would be if Zelensky wins, where... Putin is either deposed by his own people and hung from a lamppost or slinks back across the border in defeat and the Ukraine is free and wins and democracy wins and you know, hooray for uh, Mr. Zelensky. I'm not even sure about this democracy thing. I mean, in other words, I thought I read somewhere that he is pronounced that any man basically from 18 to 60 is conscripted into the military. It's like, okay, well, I guess all hands on deck, I guess, in this kind of scenario, but you know damn well that not every man from 18 to 60 that lives in the Ukraine wants to stand opposed and fight a war. I guarantee you there's some of them that don't believe in it, that would be very happy for solution one where this thing's just over and whatever terms are on the table that's what's taken but you know that's not what's being given to his own people they're they're they've been told they gotta fight fight to the death i don't think they're 
his entire population is down with that, but what do I know? I'm not over there. I know this. I think this morning ABC was reporting that Russia does have an offer on the table at the moment, which is basically stop hostilities now. The Ukraine changes its constitution such that it will not join NATO or the European Union and the separatist states will be Russian satellites, I guess, that Ukraine will recognize that the Crimea is part of Russia. Uh, and then there was a third one in there. I uh, think the third one was minor. And I thought, actually sounds kind of reasonable to me. Somebody who thinks this thing should be turned off as soon as possible. But here now, this is, a lot of this is on Zelensky. You know, it's a, and a lot of it's on the allies, NATO. If Zelensky thinks he's going to continue to get NATO assistance in increasing amounts, why the hell would he uh, sue for peace? He could just keep this going as long as he wants. And, I, and as he said over he wants to drag us into it. He's the one that wants us involved in this in the first degree. And it certainly doesn't advantage us in one way or the other to do that. You know, I'm seeing that the uh, Americans now are, we, I am an American, we are talking about cutting off the Russian oil altogether. And everybody's like, well, yeah, why don't we do that? Doesn't make any damn sense. Why are we buying their oil? I mean, well, we're buying their oil, I think, just to keep this thing from escalating. That's your real-world answer. And that's, I think, your real-world answer when it started. But now, the crazy people, the neocons, are starting to, well, they think, win the argument... And they're building popular support for this sort of thing. That, yeah, people are going to stand for $7 gas. Because, by God, freedom ain't free. Even though freedom for the Ukrainians is on the other side of the earth. And there's no guarantee they're going to be free. There's also no guarantee, and this is the biggest worry, how does this blow back on us? I mean, there's any number of ways... This could blow back in a hugely negative fashion, sh short of even nuclear war. I mean, we're already seeing the effects of inflation. Right now it's hitting oil prices. It has already hit food prices, but not with the spike that you're seeing and oil prices, well, you're likely to see a spike all across the, all across the spectrum, uh, pushing the Russians out of the United States dollar, that does nothing but hurt us. The less countries that use the dollar to transact their business just makes it worse and worse for us. It just means we're not able to export our debt to these other countries. And sooner or later, well, we're going to be paying eight, nine, ten bucks for a gallon of gas. You're going to pay two dollars for a loaf of bread. Can you afford that? The elites can. Can you? So that's one thing. Then, of course, you have the nuclear war part of this. Hey, 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 hell, they might just put troops over there. It might be fought conventionally, kind of like Korea was. So, you know, they're going to call up your sons and daughters that are in the National Guard and what have you. And it wasn't worth fighting in Afghanistan anymore, but all of a sudden we're going to fight it out in the Ukraine. That could happen. And then, of course, you have possibly just a... Uh, an attack on the homeland, whether that take the uh, form of a cyber attack or your good old traditional nuclear attack. That's what I keep saying is they don't have to nuke the whole country to make a point. 
Biden or Putin, all he'd have to do is to make a point, change the game, to change the stakes, you know, take out an aircraft carrier, take out a nuclear submarine, maybe hit an unpopulated center or population center on U.S. territory. He wouldn't have to nuke New York or Washington. These are all things that could happen in an escalatory scenario. And we're just rushing headlong right down it as if no one's ever game planned this out before. <laughs> I sent a message to a friend of mine. Uh, we'll call him Mac. That's his real name. He lives in England. Lives in the uh, Sheffield, England area. Sheffield Wednesday, right? And there was a movie made in the 80s by probably the BBC, I'm going to guess. It was about nuclear war. It had the very un-nuclear war name of Threads. You know, you, you see that name and you go, what's that? Is that about sewing? What is that? It was about nuclear war. <laughs> and in the, I just rewatched it the other night. And in the movie Threads, where both sides nuke each other into oblivion, the, the war starts where the United States overthrows the government of Iran and installs a United States-friendly Iranian government. This would have taken place in the 80s. And then the uh, Russians invade the Soviets, the communist Soviet Union at the time invade and then it just goes from there <laughs> and then today the United States overthrows the Ukrainian government and now the Russians have invaded so the start of the movie is pretty on so far as to where we are right now you know we we still have opportunities to turn this off but there are definitely people who should not have any any access to power at all that are agitating for the ex, ex escalation of this war to drag us into it and it's not good and it's up to us people to say no no this is not good I do not support this you know this is one of these things where at some point this is where you need to call your congresspeople and say, hey, I don't support this. This is not right. You know, my congresswoman, she's a neo hawk and a half. I mean, you know, she wants us to be over there with boots on the ground. Uh, and I'd like to hear her try to explain that. It's the same old, you know, tired Cold War rhetoric that they always use, the domino theory. I thought we gave that up when we lost Vietnam. But apparently not. So, I'm concerned. I'm not scared. I'm going to say I'm concerned. Because every day it goes by, this just escalates just a little more. Just a little more. You know, I, I, my, this is my assessment of what the news will be tomorrow. The Ukrainians have uh, rejected the Russian peace offering entirely said go fuck yourself that's the new Ukrainian uh, rallying cry right go fuck yourself well that's great and all but often people that say go fuck yourself are the ones themselves that end up getting fucked and I don't know we need to line up and be that person that gets fucked, along with the Ukrainians. So, another break here to gather my thoughts. As I stated in a previous video, what Biden should be doing is negotiating behind the scenes, publicly, whatever, with Putin, trying to turn this thing off. I don't think he's doing that. I don't think there are secret negotiations going on. If there are, you'll be able to tell by tomorrow because, like I said, I think there's a perfectly reasonable 
peace offering on the table right now from the Russians. And Biden should be forcing Zelensky to take it. And you're saying, well, how can he force him to take it? Well, he can't. And part of that is his own fault. In other words, Zelensky could be looking at this situation that, well, when this started, uh, nobody wanted to have anything to do with me. And now in just short of two weeks, I've damn near got these guys to declare a total economic blockade. Uh, they're talking about sending me jets. I've already got all kind of anti-tank missiles and bullets. And the you know, longer this drags on, who knows what they'll do. Uh, they may come over here themselves. Uh, might start shooting down Russian planes. All I got to do is stick it out because that's where they want to go anyway. So, you know, I just got to stick it out. You know, I'm, I'm thinking that's unfortunately to me what Zelensky is thinking because that's going to mean a lot of dead people and there's no guarantee he's going to win I think the most likely scenario is that the terms that are on the table right now is what ends up happening is that uh, the Ukraine is by force made into a neutral country and forced to recognize that Russia now controls parts of the country. And uh, like I said, I forget the third term. I didn't think it was that important. And uh, you know, it's, do you want to just accept it now? Or do you want to uh, you know, give up a lot of dead people, possibly even yourself, and accept it later? But, of course, he thinks he can win now because the NATO's kind of led him to think that. Biden should have never gotten involved in this. Every time he uh, sends more aid, he does to cheers on this side of the Atlantic. And uh, it's going to blow back in all our faces. They're grooming you. They're grooming you for a war that we have no interest in. They're already grooming you. Gas prices aren't at four and a half dollars a gallon because of Joe Biden's mismanagement and hatred of the American oil and gas industry. It's because Putin invaded Ukraine. If you're dumb enough to believe that, well, you must be a Democrat. So, another key thought on this is who in this country wants to have the war? And all our leadership from where I'm sitting pretty much want. <laughs> uh, it solves a number of problems for them. Uh, mainly that they're able then to blame our horrible economic conditions, our huge debt, the coming recession, if not depression, on the war. And at the moment, they're building popular support for the war. So, you know, the people will have to give them a pass, right? You were all for the war. I told you there'd be consequences. Freedom and free. So, the one person that I've been kind of watching to try to figure out what where he's at on this, of course, is Trump. He's the most powerful Opposition, I'm not even going to call him a Republican. He's the most powerful opposition person in the world, in the United States, whatever. Now, I saw comments that were attributed to him. Now, you don't know if that's accurate or not because it's coming from uh, news, you know, the uh, corporate news, which is wholly unreliable, wholly corrupt. But I haven't seen Trump refute these remarks. Apparently he was speaking in front of a bunch of donors this weekend, a couple hundred of them. And he said words to the effect of, you know, this is terrible, this is awful, we got to stop it. We can't allow this to go on, we've got to stop this. You know, I view that as bad. 
you know, I, I just view that as you could take that a couple different ways. I guess Earl Carey, who would, who would, has a has a Trump crush, would jump up and say, "Well, that's not what he meant. He, he doesn't really want to escalate the war. He just wants to negotiate a deal." Uh, sure, could mean that. I hope it means that. I don't think it means that. I, I don't know why he isn't more vocal at this juncture. You know, this is, he's a major political player in this event. And by him sitting silent, it just enables the warmongers to have their way. If Trump came out and said, we're not sending soldiers over there, we shouldn't send aid over there, we ought to turn this thing off. Yeah, everybody would say he's in love with Putin, but they say that anyway. That would undercut Biden's support, and he would have a less, much less strong hand to keep escalating this thing. Again, I'm from the point that Putin is not going to keep going. Putin is not going to take over Moldova. Putin is not going to invade Poland or any other neighboring country. I don't think he has the uh, resources to do it, frankly. So I think the shortest way to peace here is just cut a deal. A deal that, frankly, sounds like Putin is already signaling that he'd agree to. <laughs> so, I'm not sure why we want to keep this going. But like I said, Trump, in his silence, I don't think he's helping matters. Unless, of course, he does want to escalate this. Frankly, I think what Trump's trying to do right now, and he could attach this to DeSantis as well, they're just waiting to see which way the wind blows and then say, I would have been on the other side of it. Not exactly a leader-type position. I give Ron, Rand Paul credit, at least. He's come out and said we shouldn't be involved in this. A lot of these other guys are either with both feet, you know, on the escalatory side of things, the war side of things, or we're keeping their mouth shut. Rand Paul has had the guts to go out and say, we have not be involved in this. I'm just telling you. Well, I mean, by the time I take my walk tomorrow, there'll probably be more news, and I'm sure it'll all be bad. It'll be more escalatory. No chance of a ceasefire as long as Zelensky thinks he can win. I mean, to you hawks out there that want to keep feeding this guy aid and keep choking Russia to death, well, why don't we just go all in then? You know, why are you going for a half measure here? Well, let's just put boots on the ground. Let's just fly missions into the motherland of Russia with the United States jets. Why are we going half, half-assed half here? You know, these are, these are frankly, probably, if they're old enough, all the same people that just wanted to bulldoze North Vietnam back in the 70s. Why did we accept the L in Vietnam? Why did we not just go whole hog over there and make the thing into a parking lot? And so that... A lot of people suggest that would have been the play back then, and I imagine they're the same people that want to uh, go duke it out with the Russians now. Hey, it's an argument. Go ahead, make your argument. I'd like to hear it, frankly. Well, we're almost back to the car. We're going to call it a day here. This episode's probably already 50 minutes long because I walk slow because I'm fat. Eric, though wants to be less big E, signing off.